Hello everybody and welcome and thanks for clicking on the video. It's been a while since I had a chance to do a, a proper video. I've been rather busy with some other projects. To get started again on our op amp survey, we're going to look at the active filter circuits using an op amp and we'll compare those to the passive filters and do some of the calculations that are that are going to be involved. And I've already built a a two-stage Salon key filter and we're going to mess around with this and change it into a a single stage and, and do all the measurements on it as usual. And we'll talk about the characteristics that we can see in a single stage device and how we can improve on this. How an active device compares to a passive device. A two-stage Salon key filter with feedback resistors to set the dampening factor. And a two-stage without resistors, and this time we have to use the capacitors to set the damping factor. And we'll talk about how to make multiple stage filters and how to set the resistors or select the resistors to get the, the proper damping factor to get the characteristics we're looking for. So let's go ahead and get started. few parts that we have to deal with, very few components. However, there's no amplification in the circuit, so the best we can hope for in a perfect world would be if we had one volt in at, let's say, one hertz, that's going to make XC practically infinite. We would hope to have whatever load is hooked up out here still have one volt here. And obviously we can't get any more, so there's not going to be any gain. So we cannot get any gain from our passive filter. Another problem we have is that the roll-off of this circuit is fixed. If you remember from AC principles, once again, the roll-off for a passive circuit like this, an RC circuit, is going to be 20 dB per decade. And that is a fixed value. We can't add more RC sections after the first one and hope to get much better roll-off because we are, are going to end up having more losses in the circuit. So the circuit has no gain um, and it also has a poor roll-off. Additionally, there's no isolation between the input and the output. Whatever the values are in these resistors and capacitors, that's that's the impedance that this is going to present to the the load and to the source. So there's no isolation between those two sections. Now the advantage again is that we don't have a whole lot of parts and because we don't have a whole lot of parts this thing tends to be pretty cheap. It's inexpensive. An active filter obviously has gain, and we can set that gain function by using these feedback resistors. Remember this is RF, and this is RI, and because this is a non-inverting op amp, the gain calculation is 1 plus RF over RI. So we're always going to have at least unity as a minimum, if we make both of these values exactly the same and usually, preferably, something on the order of something greater than one. So we definitely have a gain. We don't have to use any inductors in this circuit to make the roll-off frequency better. We can actually put multiple capacitors and resistors into this circuit to improve the roll-off. So we have better roll-off because we can cascade this and still get our gain, and we also have uh, no inductors to make it better. In the passive circuit we can use inductors. We can make a T filter, put an inductor up here. But again, no gain and inductors tend to be rather large. The loading in this circuit can be adjusted by the resistors. So usually we're, we're dealing with a very low 
impedance at the output and a high impedance or a high resistance at the input and those can be adjusted by using the resistors accordingly. So this gives us good isolation between the input and the output. Of course the disadvantage is this circuit has to have power so it needs power. We can't really put any large voltages or large uh, large amount of power into this circuit either. We'll, we'll end up destroying the op amp. In this one, uh, power handling is a little bit better. So this one definitely, it needs power, but it can't handle much input power. And we also have a limited bandwidth that we have to deal with in the op amp. The, the bandwidth is going to be set by whatever the, you know, the design is. So if we're dealing with the 741, the bandwidth is going to be limited to a couple of megahertz. And also, you've got to remember, there's going to be a, there can be a slew rate in there. So if we make this signal too large, we can get distortions at the output. So we have a bandwidth limitation as well. Overall... The, uh, the, the active op amp is obviously a, a preferable choice. Uh, we have gain, we can adjust the impedances, that gives us isolation between input and output. We don't have to use any inductors. By using more resistive capacitive RC networks, we can actually improve the roll off, and we have that wonderful isolation in there. Again, limitations, needs power, bandwidth is limited, uh, can handle a lot of power. So now let's take a look at some of the characteristics that we would expect to see in a low-pass filter or, or pretty much any, any. Here's a fairly typical graph of what a filter's response might look like given uh, an or an amp amplitude given on this side over a range of frequencies. You can see that we have a pass band, and the pass band are all those frequencies that are considered to be passed to the next stage. It's not uncommon, it's actually very typical, to say that the pass band goes all the way from zero to the point where we get to negative 3 dB. So everything, every frequency between this point and negative 3 dB is considered to be passed on to the next stage. Everything after that, which is along this red line, this is called the skirt or the transition region is considered to be rejected. The cutoff frequency, now I guess before I go on we should say that if we had a perfect low pass filter we would like to see that as soon as we get to some frequency, in this case one radian per second, we actually have no, we don't have a transition like this as shown here. This is also called the skirt. The, we don't have a transition, it's the, it just stops instantly. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen because we have to deal with uh, the physics in the real world and the components that we deal with. So once we get to that negative 3 dB point, we start getting a roll-off. Now, a typical RC, a passive circuit, is going to have a 20 dB per decade roll-off. So a decade is a increase of 10 times. So when we go from 1 to 10, this is one decade. And if we follow the line up, you can see this is the one point, and here's the other one. And from this point down, and then over this way, 10 times, gave us a change of 20 dB. You might see some charts that give you a negative 6 dB per octave standard. Negative 6 dB per octave and 20 dB per decade are, are exactly the same thing. An octave is a doubling of the frequency. So we once again start with a 1 radian per second. We go to 2 radians per second right here. Follow this up and it would be approximately at this point. And you can see that the change from the critical frequency to this point is roughly going to be about... 6 dB. So not really accurate. Chart's not going to make it possible to get much more accuracy than, or from it. So 20 dB per decade is the same thing as 6 dB per octave. Then we have the, the skirt, 
or the transition region. Now, the transition region goes all the way up to that point called the stop band. And the stop band is actually set by the designer or the engineer who came up with this. And he said, he can say, oh, once we get to 50 dB, that's my stop band. I'm not going to worry about anything after that point. So here's negative 50 dB. The skirt then, or the transition region, would go from here to here. Everything in there is in the transition region or it's on the skirt. Some of the things that the chart doesn't show you is what if we have any ringing in the circuit. This is a Bode plot or if we had a a spectrum analyzer that could go down to these lower frequencies and unfortunately I don't. If we had a spectrum analyzer this is what we would see. We would see an amplitude on one side in decibels and then the frequency going across. So we would get a chart that looks much like this. Even so, with that, we don't see any of the, of the time-based functions. Now, you have to look at, in an RC circuit, and if we threw inductors into it as well, it would be even worse. But in an RC circuit, we can have ringing. We can have overshoots. And then we can have settling. Because we can use these, these filters on square waves as well. And the graph doesn't show us any of these elements, and we're not really going to worry about these too much. One last thing. That negative 3 dB point is, is kind of arbitrary. There are filters that are called equiripple, and they will actually have variations throughout their, their pass band, and the negative 3, 3 dB point might act, not actually be the cutoff frequency. And when we deal with a Chebyshev filter, it's, some, it's somewhat like this, but we still consider even in a Chebyshev the negative 3 dB point to be the, that, that cutoff frequency. So there's a, a quick overview of all of the critical points in a... Here are the response curves for four different filter types, a Bessel, Butterworth, Chebyshev, and Elliptic. The one we're going to be working with principally, this is the Butterworth filter. And the Butterworth, which is shown here in this orange tracing, you can see how, how flat it is throughout its region. These are all going to have roughly the same pass bands at about negative 3 dB. But the Butterworth is really flat throughout its pass band. So it has a very flat response. And because of that flat response, it is called the maximally flat filter or response. Unfortunately, it also has a phase shift, and a phase shift is something I should have talked about just a few moments ago, but in a RC circuit, we have a capacitor. That capacitor's XC is going to vary with frequency. So guess what happens when we start putting in something like, let's say, an audio signal, which can consist of anything from 20 hertz up to 20 kHz. As that audio signal goes through the filter, XC is going to vary, and it's going to filter or cause a phase shift variation between the frequencies. And that's going to cause the shift at the output. And if you're using a, an audio signal, for, or if you're using audio with Butterworth, you really aren't going to be very happy with the output because of that phase shift. So you have to use some kind of another, some kind of other uh, filter design. If you were putting a pulse into the circuit, you would want to use a Bessel. The Bessel has no phase shift, but the roll-off rate is really slow. So if you look at this roll-off rate, it's rather poor, so it's low roll-off. In a Chebyshev, which is the blue trace, you can see we have a really rapid roll-off. So I'll just put a little line on here. Rapid roll-off. But the gain that's in the pass band because of this variation, you can see that the gain is not constant. It varies. And that can be something that can be pretty disconcerting in, in some systems. The elliptic curve 
it, you can see in the red trace, it has a variation in the passband and it also has some variations in the the elliptic curve is actually two filters. In this case, it would be a low-pass filter and a notch filter put together. Uh, you get a nice roll-off rate, but at the expense of having some rather unfortunate variations in the So these are just three different types that are out there. And you achieve each one of these by changing what's called the damping factor. And the damping factor is... Let me break this one out. The damping factor is just the resistance ratio between these two values, RF and RI. Not only does it set the gain, but it sets what's called the damping factor, and we'll discuss that in just a minute. But the damping factor, for example, the this circuit right here, this has a it has two stages uh, or two poles, and a pole is a pair of resistors and capacitors. So. In a normal low-pass filter with a, with a single pole, a first-order filter, imagine that these two resistors, this uh, resistor R2 and C1, aren't, aren't there. We just take those out and we replace it by wire and take that out completely. So now we just have R1 and C2. So now we have a single pole filter. This doesn't have a damping factor, so we don't have to worry about it. Now when we put a second pole in here, so now we have two filters essentially, R1, C2, R2, C1. Now we have to start dealing with the damping factor. The damping factor gives us the filter's frequency response characteristics as well as the gain. All of the characteristics that we just looked at from these filters are only achievable when we have a multipole filter system. A single pole system would look like this. This is a single pole filter. A pole is a combination of resistors and capacitors that are on the input side of our op amp. So this would be a single pole system. This would give you 20 dB per decade roll off. What if we wanted higher roll off? Let's say 40 dB per decade. That can be achieved by just adding another resistor and capacitor. And this time we put the capacitor across from the, from the output to a junction between R1 and R2. Now, the addition of a second set of, or a second set of components gives us a 40 dB per decade roll-off. If I wanted to get 60 dB per decade, I could add a, a third pair of resistor capacitors. And now I would have what's called a third order. So by adding more, more and more of these resistor-capacitor combinations, I can improve the roll-off. It's not typical that we look at that we have any more than two on any single op-amp, two, two poles or two orders on any op-amp. If we wanted to get more than more roll-off than let's say 40 dB per decade, we would add another op amp and then feed this output to it and then we would have to change uh, a few other things such as the damping factor. Now the damping factor again determines how we get this when we have a particular type of filter for example this is what's called this is a Salen key filter and a Salen key, that's just a topology. That's the way it's hooked up. And this is, it's pretty much, pretty much one of the easiest ones to use. It doesn't take very many parts. But a filter has to have a certain damping factor. The damping factor is set by the values of RF and RI. And the damping factor is calculated by taking 2 minus RF divided by RI. In a filter, and we'll talk about this a little bit more shortly, we want a damping factor of 0.586. So the ratio between the 56k ohm resistor and the 33k ohm resistor should be 0.586. And that'll give us also the gain. So we know that we're now going to have 0.586 for the, the gain from RF and RI plus 1. So the overall gain of the circuit is 1.586. Well, that gives us 4 dB. 4 dB, believe it or not, is what ends up giving us a 
Butterworth filter. So when we have 4 dB of gain, we have a Butterworth filter. If the gain were greater than 4 dB, now we have a Chebyshev filter. So make the gain higher, we actually change the, all of the filter characteristics in the circuitry. If we have a gain of less than 4 dB, and I should say not AV, but gain in dB, if I have a gain in dB of less than 4 dB, then I have a Bessel filter. And an elliptic filter, that's a little bit more complex because now we're having to deal with gain functions and a second filter, the a notch filter. So by changing the resistors that are in this feedback network, I change the gain values of the, of the, of the circuit. Again, remember this is a non-inverting, so it's 1 plus whatever the ratio is between these two. This happens to be 1.586. And that gives you all of these characteristics. Change the dB, change the gain function, you change the filter's characteristics. because. You now, fortunately for us, the damping factors for all of these circuits have already been calculated. And we're going to discuss the Butterworths rather in extensively in, in a few minutes. And the damping factor is going to vary by the number of stages that we have. And this is shown right here. So if you look at this one, you can see that we have a two-pole filter on the first stage. We have another two-pole filter on the second stage and another two-pole filter on the third stage. So overall, this is a six-pole low-pass filter. And for every pole, we have 20 dB of, of roll-off. So with six poles in this example, we have six times 20, so we have a roll-off of 120 dB per decade. How do we select the values for RF and RI? And these two resistors are what determine the damping factor. The charts have already been made, thank God, otherwise the math can be a little bit extensive. So for the first stage, for a two-pole filter, remember, a, a single-pole filter like this does not have a damping factor. So we aren't making or, or any of the other types like the Bessel with a, a single-pole or a first-order filter. First-order filter only has this stage. So this is just a, a straight low-pass filter. When we get into the multi-pole filters, multiple orders, multiple poles. Now we can characterize the output by using a damping factor and for the Bessel functions or the or the Butterworth output this is the chart that you can find just about anywhere and I just made this one up really quickly off of uh, some text uh, from some text that I had. So stage number one which would be this stage right here has to have a ratio of the feedback resistor to the input resistor of 0.586. The second stage has to have a ratio of 1.235. Now notice that if we add this second stage we have to go back and change the first stage resistors. The objective in this is always to get, remember this is 4 dB. The, it was at 4 decibels that gave us the characteristics of a Butterworth filter. That means we want 4 decibels here, and we want 4 decibels here. So we have to change the resistors in this feedback network and input network every time that we want to add another stage. If we had only a single stage, so all we have is this right here, then we would use that feedback ratio of 0.586 for this stage. And in uh, the circuit that I was uh, just showed you, that would give us 33k to 56k and that came out pretty close. If I want to add another stage, now I must change 
that first stage, the feedback resistors, to have a ratio of 0.152. So I can't use these anymore. I have to change them to a 0.152 ratio. The second stage is going to have a 1.235 ratio. Remember, though, that this stage has a gain of 1. So you have to take that into account. Some charts might show you this as 2.235. Uh, with a gain value instead of resistor values. So if it was showing this as stage 2 as 2.235 for the gain, remember subtract 1 to get the resistor ratio. So it's 1.235 for this, resist, this set of resistors. So this ratio is now 1.235. This ratio is 0.152. And the gain for the stage is 2.57 from input to output which is 8 dB so again we did that increase of 4 decibels. If we add a, another stage so now we have 6 poles now we have to change the resistor ratios again this one has to be 0.068 this one has to be 0.56 and this one is 1.483 now every time that we add another stage or another set of uh, another op amp at each one and we have a two pole or second order op amp in this stage we increase the roll off rate with two our rate is two times twenty with with four it's four times twenty with six it's six times twenty so you can see the roll off rate goes progressively higher and the gain goes progressively higher as well but it goes all up always for our a butterworth at about four db for each set of poles, for each two poles. And this is the overall gain that you get from the entire circuit. So let's take a, another quick look at, at damping factors and, and see how they work in. Before we go on to examine a, a second order filter, let's take a look at a, a first order filter. And we have to pay the greatest amount of attention to the value of C1 in the operation of this low pass device. We know that XC is going to vary with frequency. The, the calculation is 1 over 2 pi FC to get the value of XC. So at really low frequencies, let's say we have something on the order of, of that can uh, vary from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 K hertz, so the, the range of, of hearing, you know, only if you're, if you're still a baby. At really low frequencies, this one nanofarad capacitor is going to look like an open. And on an open, we're going to apply pretty much all of the voltage that's coming into the circuit. With all the voltage dropped across our capacitor C1, because it's open, we have all the voltage then on the inverting or the non-inverting input. So we have the, the most signal at the lowest frequencies. As the frequency begins to go up, the value of XC on our 1 nanofarad capacitor drops. As the resistance on this drops, we get less and less of a voltage drop on it, which means we get less and less of an input signal and less output. And this device will give us a 20 dB per decade roll-off. If we are trying to find out what the cutoff frequency is, it's exactly the same uh, calculation as we would use with a passive filter, just 2 pi R1C1, and we know R1 is, is 10K, and that C1 is 1 nanofarad, and this is going to give us a frequency of 15.92 kilohertz as our cutoff frequency. Now our cutoff frequency, FC, or our critical frequency, is going to be minus 3 dB down from what actual what the actual output signal is going to be. So we need to find the output in decibels. Well, first we need to find what the gain is going to be. So RF over RI. And for this one, we have 33K divided by 56K and then add 1. And we're going to get a gain of 1.5. Eight, nine, and we'll assume a voltage in of one volt, so an output voltage of 1.589 volts. Now we want to convert that to dB. So 1.589 out over one volt in, take the logarithm of that and multiply it by 20, 
and we'll get a gain of about 4, 4 dB, 4 4.02 dB. So we need to know what voltage is it going to be that we have a gain of, of 1 dB. 4 minus the 3 dB, that gives us the 1 dB, so it's 1.02 decibels. And we need to know what that frequency or what that voltage is going to be. And although I didn't include it in here, and I probably should have, if you want to get the voltage from a, from a decibel value, it's a relatively simple calculation. We can uh, either do it for AV or for V out. If it's for AV, we would take and this would give us the actual gain. So if we did this, 10, 1.02 over 20, all this would do would give us the gain ratio. We're not really interested in the gain ratio. We'd like to know what the actual voltage is. And to do that, all we have to do is multiply this gain ratio by our reference voltage, V ref. And V ref just happens to be our input voltage, so we're multiplying it by 1 volt. And if we do all that, we would get at this point an actual value for, not AV, but the actual value for V out. And that is 1.1. .1 so we're looking for a voltage out of about 1.13 volts. That's probably as close as we're going to be able to measure it with an oscope. If we want to double check to see if this is actually going to give us a value of 1 dB, we can plug it back into this calculation. And now we would have 1.13 1.125 over 1 times the logarithm of that, of that value, times 20. And we get 1.02. So that's pretty close, so that's a good value. So when we are negative 3 dB down from our actual gains of the circuit, we should have a, vo a voltage at the output of 1.13 volts approximately. And that value of 1.13 volts should occur at 15.92 kilohertz. This is the breadboarded circuit. So this is our, our single pole uh, low pass filter. And here's our 10k ohm resistor or 1 nanofarad capacitor. The feedback network, a 33k ohm resistor and a 56k ohm resistor. And of course our op amp, our positive voltage and our negative voltage. In this case I'm using plus 10 and minus 10 and the common ground. So when we put our signal in here and we sweep it through a set of frequencies, let's say 100 hertz up to uh, 100k hertz, what we should see is that as the frequency goes up on the input, the output should have an attenuated value and it should go 3 dB down or to about 1.13 volts at 15.92. Now the output is going to look a little bit different than we see on this chart. This is a, a logarithmic chart. We'll be looking at actual voltages. So the output is going to appear as a, as a, as a shape that looks like this. And as we get to the critical frequency, let's say it's 15.92K and it's at this point, and this point, the, the voltage is going to decrease and then it's just going to pretty much level out as we get way down here. When we put a second order filter into this, a second pole, we should get a more rapid decrease in, in the voltages. But this is what the wave shape should look like at... Uh, on the oscilloscope when we apply the, the frequency. This is the output from our first order low pass filter and this would be the low frequencies and this is as we're going higher in frequency. Currently I have the 
function generator set to generate a sine wave. It's going to be sweeping, and it's going to be sweeping from 20 hertz to 120 k hertz, and it's going to do so in 1.2 seconds. So that would mean that roughly every 100 milliseconds we're going to cover 1 kilohertz on the scope. I've started the trace as close as I could to the beginning, so we should, you know, we can get an approximation of uh, of what's happening over the frequency range. So at per division as set by the time and the time here. So our first block would be 10 k hertz and we're up to 20 and 30 and then 40 and then so on. And we would have our 3 dB, 3 dB point roughly at, at this point 15.92 k hertz. And you can see the shape of this wave. It's not going to be a, like a Gabodi plot and, or the output from a spectrum analyzer where we're using a tracking generator. So what we can do though is take the uh, function generator and set it to 15.92 kHz and measure the amplitude. And at 15.92 kHz, that being the critical frequency, we should have approximately 1.13 volts, and give or take a little bit. So let's take it out of sweep mode and just put in a frequency of 15.92. 2 kilohertz and we'll make the signal just a little bit larger and turn on our cursors and adjust from there and then adjust the lower cursor up a little bit and you can see from one cursor to the other we have 1.152 and that's pretty close to 1.13. So we look, it looks like we could go a little bit higher in the frequency to get to that uh, negative 3 dB point, but our low pass filter, it, here's our second order filter, uh, low pass, and it's a Salon key topology and it's going to have Butterworth characteristics, so it's going to have a maximally flat output. Uh, any signal that's coming into the circuit is going to be applied to the non-inverting input, so we're always going to have a gain of, of plus one. And again, we have to take frequency into account. That's what this device is for, of course. And we know that as frequency goes up, XC goes down. At low frequencies, any signal is going to go through R1 and R2. And because XC is going to be extremely high across C2, most, a lot of the voltage, or most of the voltage, is going to be dropped across there. That's going to then be applied to the non-inverting input and give us the output. Any high-frequency components that may sneak through could be fed back and have to go through the circuit once again. As the frequency goes up, XC goes down in value. So the higher XC goes, the higher the frequency goes, the lower XC goes. So signal comes in sees XC as a very low reactance, gets sent to ground. That means that there's essentially no voltage or a very small voltage developed across C2, so there's no or a very small voltage at the output. Any high frequency components that do go through are also going to see C1 as a low impedance path and be fed back into the circuit to improve the roll-off rate. Now the frequency, the critical frequency, is exactly the same uh, for two transistor or two capacitors and two resistors if the values are exactly the same on the resistors. So if it's 10k on both of them and one nanofarad on both capacitors, you can just use this equation. You can use different values for R1, R2, C1, and C2. If you do that, then you have to use this. You have to square all of the the uh, the multiplied or the multiplicands, and then uh, this will give you the average of those values and give you the critical frequency. So if we were to plug all of these values in, 10k, 10k, 1 nano, 1 nano, we would still get exactly the same value we got for this. And we haven't changed anything from the previous use, so it's still going to be 15.92 kilohertz. The gain of the circuit is still going to be plus 1 and RF over RN. So RF divided by RN gave us 0.589, and that plus 1, so we're going to have a gain of 1.589. And if you remember from 
the previous section that gives us just over 4 dB, 4.02 dB, I believe is what it was. Now we have to include the damping factor. The damping factor is is related to Q in a way. And if you recall Q, that was the ability of a system to return energy that it had received. If we were thinking about inductors, it would be XL over RI. So this would be the energy stored in the magnetic field, and RI would be the energy that would be dissipated when that magnetic field collapses. It's a resistive element. Well, this circuit has a Q also, and the Q is actually related to damping factor as 1 over DF. So RDF is going to be for a Butterworth circuit, and remember the first the the relationship between these two resistors for a second order was 0.586 so it's going to be 2 minus RF over RI that was your damping factor so 0.586 so that gives us 1.414 which probably is a is a very familiar number and we can reverse engineer this if we knew what the damping factor was. So we get 2 minus 1.414, and that would give us the resistor. So 0.586 again. Well, this is, going to, this is going to be important a little bit later on, because if you recall that Q also gives us bandwidth. So if we know the, the center frequency of a circuit, and then we know the Q of the circuit, we can get bandwidth and you can see that if we're going to use sal and keys which we're going to also do later on that the q is not going to be very uh it's it's a very small number and and being such a small number the bandwidth is going to be really wide so sal and keys aren't the the best way to get a really narrow bandwidth this is a broad bandwidth circuit the q of the circuit essentially comes into our gain and it is related to these two resistors so knowing these we can come up with the damping factor so i guess that that's a little bit of a of an aside so for the q and fortunately for most of the configurations well all of the configurations that we've talked about the butterworth or mentioned at least the butterworth chebyshev elliptical and bessel all those damping factors are are already calculated and it makes your work a, a heck of a lot easier so in this circuit because it is a a second order filter what we can expect for the roll off rate is something quite a bit steeper than this so with a with two poles remember every pole that we have is going to be minus 20 db so this is like a, a single pole device if i add another pole now i get 40 db per decade so coming from this point i actually go down to this point in in one in one decade so there's my 40 db and my you can see my line is going to get or my roll off is going to get much sharper the the transition region is narrower the skirt is steeper so when I put this circuit on a breadboard what I can expect is again a, a gain of 1.589 volts assuming that I have a, a 1 volt input and that's what I will put in so 1.4 1 volt peak in and I will get 1.589 volts peak to peak out assuming that these are perfect and everything else is perfect as well I should have a circuit that has a, a roll-off rate at a critical frequency of 15.92 kHz at negative 3 dB and at a 40 dB per decade roll-off rate. It is possible to actually calculate some of the frequencies or some of the voltages that you would have at various frequencies and it's a it's a somewhat involved problem it's not not terribly uh, complex but the equation would be the gain in decibels is equal to 20 times the log 
of 1.586 divided by the square root of 1 plus Fn critical frequency raised to the fourth power. So yeah, maybe it is a little bit a little bit long-winded, but it 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 will work uh, to give you a, a pretty good uh, result from this. So let's say uh, that we put in 45 kilohertz, and we're going to go ahead and test this on the scope uh, afterwards. But let's say that we put in a, a signal of 45 kilohertz, and we also have a critical frequency which we know is 15.92 kHz. So we need to raise that to the fourth power and then add one to it and then take the square root of that result and what we would have then is 1.586 and all of this just comes out to be 8.05 so parenthesize that so 1.56 times or divided by 8.05 and then we're going to take the, the logarithm of that, multiply it by 20, and we will get negative 14.1 dB. Well, what the hell does that mean to us? 14.1 dB doesn't work uh, on an oscope. So we have to convert that 14.1 dB to a voltage. And we did that earlier. And... So 14.1 dB, I should let this dry a little bit more. All right, 14.1 dB. And we want to convert that to a voltage. And if you remember that we could take 10 to the power of the dB that we were interested in, or that we have, so we have 14.1 divided by 20 multiply it by our reference voltage and that's one volt and that would give us the voltage at that particular frequency and since we're using the 14.1 we know that this 14.1 is equate equates to 15.92 kHz so we 10 to the power of negative 14 14.1 divided by 20 times 1 and we're going to get about uh, 197 millivolts peak to peak so about 200 millivolts and so that's what we should see on the scope give or take about 5-10 um, percent and again because of the variations in the components so in a nutshell we have a, a low-pass filter it's a Salen key configuration or Salen key topology, and that's just the order of the these resistors and capacitors. And guess what? It was indeed invented by two guys named Salen and Key. Uh, and it's a uh, very simple, uh, very few components. So Salen key topology, low pass filter. It has a Butterworth characteristic. That characteristic is determined by the damping factor or the ratio of these resistors. We know that the ratio of these resistors is 0.586, and that gives us a damping factor if we plug it in here. And the damping factor is related to how the, the circuit responds. And we should get 4, de, 4 dB of gain. So what we'll do next is crank this voltage through here and see if we get 1.589. See if we do get a critical frequency of about 15.92 kilohertz. And we'll check that at uh, 45 kHz, I believe that's what we used, which corresponds to negative 14.1 dB. We should have a voltage of about 200 millivolts peak to peak. And again, on the output, we should see in the, in the previous circuit, we saw that we had a, a curve that was somewhat like that and this is for our 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 single pole or or first uh, a first order filter and if we add and let's see if I can find another marker 
A second pole, we'd still have the initial roll off, still the same critical frequency, but now. This is our second order low pass filter with the Salen key topology. You can see the resistors, 10Ks, and the two 1 nanofarad caps, and that creates our, our filtering network to make it low pass. The resistors are set are picked to give us a, a Butterworth filter characteristic. Given the values that were selected, we should see 15.92 kHz for the critical frequency, and we should see a steeper roll-off than we had for the, the single pass when we only had one resistor and one capacitor. And we'll go ahead and compare the difference between the single pass and the low pass on the scope so you can see it a little bit better than than just on a on a piece of paper. Here's the output of our second order filter. You can see I've got the function generator set to generate a sweep from 10 Hertz to 120 K over 1.2 seconds. The scope is set up to 100 milliseconds per division so approximately every block is going to be 10 K Hertz assuming I can get that zero to trigger as close to this uh, this point as possible. You can see the roll-off rate is a little bit steeper than what we had for the first order filter and we'll go ahead and actually save one of these traces and compare it to the the first order filter. The the critical frequency, I need to get this to stabilize a little bit more, would be at 15.92 kHz so we're looking roughly at, at this point and we should have about 1.13 volts at that critical frequency. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. We'll take the scope out of sweep and we have 15.92 kilohertz already selected and make the, the signal a little bit larger. Oh, there we go. And we have one, two, three, four, five point six divisions approximately at 200 millivolts, so it looks like it'd be about 1.2 volts. So we're really close to that critical frequency, uh, as, as close as we can get to on, on a scope. Now, if we wanted to check the frequency or the amplitude at 45 kHz to see if we, our computation was correct, we should have a amplitude of roughly one or 200 millivolts if I remember correctly. Yep, yes, 200 millivolts. So I'm going to adjust the frequency to 45 kHz and we'll measure that signal and see if we have about 200 millivolts. And so, and get it to trigger again. So one, two, three, four, about 220 millivolts. So we're, we're close, uh, we're within about 10%. So we do have a, a good computation for that second position. So now let's go ahead and look at the actual frequency response, a comparison between a single pole and a two pole. As a way of comparison, I now have the output of the single pole filter and still the Salen key. And we're going to use this signal and compare it to the dual pole. And we can see the, the roll-off rate. It's not very steep, uh, pretty shallow, so we're looking at 20 dB per decade. And if I take a reference using that input, and now I make my device back into a dual pole, and make a few connection changes, and there is my dual pole now in the in the yellow trace. So the original trace for the single pole filter is the gray and the dual pole is the yellow trace now. And you can see how much steeper the roll-off rate is at, at 40 dB per decade than, than the single pole device. So let's take a quick look now at a unity gain Salen key using uh, Butterworth again. And this time instead of using the resistors to do the or set the damping factor, we're going to use the capacitors. Here's the last configuration I'm going to talk about, and uh, I know this is already running kind of long, and hopefully I haven't lost any anyone's attention yet. The um, 
circuit we've been dealing with so far that has been a selling key and, and has a been a Butterworth has used a set of resistors to create a feedback network on the inverting input and this one does not have a feedback network. This is a unity gain Salen key Butterworth which means that one volt in is going to give us one volt out. The way that we have to calculate the damping factor for this one since we can't use resistors on the feedback network we're going to use the capacitors and the capacitors are going to be at a ratio of C2 uh, to C1 and we can actually, you know, let's simp simplifying this. We know that the damping factor has got to be 1.414. And that's been the case for the resistors that we had earlier, or 2 minus RF over RI. So 2 minus RF over RI, and that was the damping factor, gave us a value of 1.414. So there's our damping factor. And we know that that's going to be equal to 2 C over C1. Well, if I square both sides of, of the equation, 2 and 2, I'm going to end up with 2 is equal to 4 times C2 over C1. So 2 is equal to 4 C2 over C1. Well, to get this to be equal, I have to make this ratio 1 half. So if I make C2 to C1 1 half, so let's say I have 1 nanofarad on one side and 2 nanofarads on the other, that would make this ratio 1 half. So 4 times 1 half equals 2, and it's true. So now we would have our, our capacitor ratio, and of course we could change it to others. But if we do this, obviously we can't just plug into the original equation for determining the critical frequency by saying Fc is equal to 1 over 2 pi Rc, since the values for C are different. So now we have to, we really do have to go into this method uh, to and get the average of, of all of these, and that'll give us the critical frequency. And from here on out, the circuit behaves exactly the same way as what we've already discussed. So I'm not going to go over it in any great depth other than to indicate that it's the ratio of C1 to C2 that gives us the damping factor. And for a uh, second order Butterworth, it's going to be 1.414 for the damping factor. And you can see how I came up with the resistors. I don't plan on going over the high-pass filters because to get a high-pass filter from a topology like this one, the Salen keys, all we have to do is reverse the components. We place the capacitors where the resistors are and the resistors where the capacitors are. So now instead of having a circuit which was low-pass with a critical frequency of 15.92, if I place a capacitor here, here and then place resistors here and here and use the same values I now have a high pass circuit so everything on the low side is going to be attenuated because it can't make it through these capacitors they are very reactive and as the frequency goes up they become less reactive more signal goes through and bigger output so to do a high pass filter all you have to do is reverse the components. Calculations are exactly the same as they are for the low pass. So I know this ran a little bit long, but I want it to be thorough and, and cover all the, the salient points. And there's a lot of material that I haven't covered because there are books that are written on, on this topic. In the next go round, I hope to cover the band pass and band reject filters and I'm going to use the Salen key configurations or variations thereof and then we'll see where we can go from there maybe some anti-log uh, filters or, or anti-log devices using op amps and then move on to some other topic because I'm sure everybody else is, is getting a little tired of op amps although they're as if you've been watching all the videos they're rather they're great devices they really do a good job so thank you again for watching. I appreciate your time. If you like the video, give us a, a thumbs up. And 